Check, 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 one, two. Good evening, everyone. My name is Chuck Lambert. I'm Director of Special Services for the Council Rock School District. Can you all hear me in the back? I want to welcome you to tonight's presentation, E-Cigarettes and Vaping, Health Concerns for Parents of school Aid Youth. Our presenter this evening is Dave Fialco. He is an internationally certified prevention specialist as well as a nationally certified tobacco treatment specialist and a commissioned FDA officer. David has over 17 years experience working in the drug and alcohol and mental health fields, working in treatment, prevention, cessation, and tobacco enforcement. David is employed by the Council of Southeast Pennsylvania as a prevention specialist. His broad range of duties and experience allows him to provide up-to-date and effective presentations on many health-related topics throughout the state and abroad. Uh, before we get started, just let everyone know we are live streaming this presentation. It will be available on our YouTube channel for later viewing. There will be a, sec a segment at the end for question and answers. We will not put the camera on you if you are asking a question, but the questions will be recorded. And with that, I'll introduce Dave to begin speaking. All right, thank you, Charles. Um, my name is uh, Dave, David, Mr. Fialco, whatever you want to call me. Uh, if there are questions, you can shoot them out as we go, uh, because this is a lot of information. Um, I am a certified tobacco treatment specialist, so what I do is I help people quit smoking. Um, and that has been kind of the form of people coming to me as, you know, whether motivated by their doctor, their spouse, their children, whatever the reason that they are seeking to quit or cease tobacco use, they come and find a specialist to help assess what type of smoker they are, what would be the best methods to utilize, and combine counseling if needed with, uh, you know, uh, what's called um, uh, FDA-approved cessation methods. So um, it's traditionally been tobacco. And in the last several years, really the two to three years, we have seen people now come to us requesting assistance in quitting vaping. And it's kind of interesting because vaping was originally designed as a cessation aid. So about 10 years ago, uh, it was originally designed as an alternative to transdermal patches, which are a 21 milligram patch. Uh, you have step one, step two, step three. They adhere to the skin. They transdermally release nicotine into the bloodstream so that the individual can get through the day without experiencing too many or too extreme withdrawal symptoms. Um, that's considered a long acting uh, nicotine replacement treatment. Now there's also short acting such as gum, lozenges, inhalers, um, which provide smaller doses of nicotine when combined with the long acting. So a person may be on a patch all day, they'll still experience a withdrawal, and now they are experiencing this craving, and so now they can actually chew some gum in combination with the patch to get them through that craving. So um, these methods are what we call risk-benefit assessed. So does the benefit of using nicotine in this way outweigh the risk? And in this way, it does, because we know how and what exactly is being transdermally absorbed into the blood. We know exactly the content and how much nicotine is being uh, uh, mucosally absorbed through the gum. And so it's FDA approved. It's time tested. It works. There's a start date and an end date. Vaping, the problem with it and the problem that it's not FDA approved, the reason why it's not FDA approved is because we just don't know. We don't have enough information. We don't have double blind longitudinal studies of 10 or more years showing outcomes, health effects, health concerns, risk benefit. We can't adequately assess the risk versus the benefit, but we do know that right now the risk outweighs the benefit because there is a safer way to quit smoking than vaping, and that is the approved safe nicotine replacement products. Um, so vaping, unfortunately, 
there's no standard. We have things like the Jewel, we have things like the Soren, we have things like uh, names like Mac 10, all kinds of different names. They're each different and they each have their own supplier of nicotine juice and ingredients, and these ingredients are not listed on the devices. So what you're actually inhaling, we don't know. They're not FDA approved. They're FDA regulated. Cigarettes are FDA regulated because they are an item of concern and we have to regulate them. So people hear vape devices are FDA regulated and they assume that they're safe. They're not. They are a health risk. They come with concerns. So if they were safe, they'd be FDA approved or that when we know exactly what's in it and the benefit outweighs the risk, then they will be FDA approved. But to date, they're not. So my biggest concern is that either way you put it, whether it's a cigarette or whether it's a vape device, the end result is you're delivering nicotine into the bloodstream of the point user. So when a person uses nicotine, it's usually a, a positive response for that individual because nicotine delivers a stimulant effect and a pleasurable effect, all right? So when we look at nicotine, it's an addictive substance in itself. Nicotine is the key ingredient in cigarettes that makes it difficult for somebody to smoke. It's the tar, it's the smoke, it's the carcinogens that are historically linked to cancers and death and um, you know lung function and all of the things that are impacted by inhaling heat, tar, smoke, particulate matter, and carcinogens in smoke. Now, vaping, and it's not even vaping. It doesn't turn to vapor until you exhale and it mixes with the, uh, with the, uh, the ambient air out here. Um, it's an aerosol. And an aerosol is particulate matter suspended in a water molecule. So when you are vaping, as it's coined, you are actually aerosoling. You're inhaling a water molecule which has particulate matter and nicotine and other flavorings suspended in that water molecule, which now are inhaled deep into your lung tissue and do some pretty significant damage. Um, we have no regulatory way of knowing what flavor, what product has this, that, or the other thing in it. But we'll get to some of the flavorings that are used in a little while. Nicotine, when vaped or aerosoled, uh, we call them electronic nicotine delivery systems at the FDA um, because that's just a generalized term. It's an electronic device that delivers nicotine into the bloodstream. Um, the nicotine is the addictive part, but it also produces a stimulant effect because nicotine is a very potent stimulant. So when we were, you know, I'm, I, I remember being in high school in the 80s. We had smoking sections in our high schools. You could go out and smoke with your teachers in the 80s, right? When we think back on that, that's just mind numbing. But why was that the case? Because we just didn't realize the risk benefit. We accepted it socially. It was a norm. Over 40% of the population smoked tobacco product in the 80s. And now we're down below 17%. So we're making strides. We now know that smoking is directly linked to cancer and strokes and coronary heart disease and everything else that is linked to uh, tobacco use. But nicotine is the drug that is the reason why people smoke. It provides a stimulant effect. So when you could smoke indoors in the 80s and 70s and 60s, if you were a worker in a cubicle, you'd be working in your cubicle and you'd be a smoker and there's a non-smoker next to you. That cubicle worker would be smoking that nicotine cigarette, pack of 20 a day maybe, maybe two packs, and they would be getting a stimulant effect. So they are actually more focused than the non-smoker because it's a stimulant. It stimulates not only the brain, but it also stimulates the cardiovascular system and the central nervous system. So it increases heart rate. It increases blood pressure at the same time. Now, people are like, sometimes I'll talk to young people and be like, you know, hey, you know, I'll tell you all this about it. And they'll be like, well, that's not a big deal because exercise also increases blood pressure and heart rate. I'm like, I get that. But exercise is transient. It raises it, it lowers it, 
It raises it and it lowers it. It never stays there for extended durations. Nicotine will raise the blood pressure and the heart rate at the same time for anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes after a, after a dose. At the same time, it constricts the arteries and blood vessels. It strips away the Teflon-like coating of the arterial walls of the, of the arteries. And it releases stored fats into the bloodstream, which now adhere to the walls of the arteries creating plaque and doubling the likelihood that that young person will experience a stroke or coronary heart disease in their adult life, just from the nicotine. No smoke needed, no carcinogens needed, no tar needed. It's just the nicotine. And so when young people are like, dude, it's just nicotine, <laughs> I get it. Their developing brains are like, you know, hey, pleasurable experience when I use this. I'm indestructible, what's the risk? There is a risk, and unfortunately, the damage is irreversible. So when you meet people who are smokers, when people come to me who are smokers and they want to quit, they've usually had at least seven or eight attempts uh, unsuccessful. And so it takes a minimum of seven to eight attempts to successfully quit for about 80% of the people. Now, when I ask them, why do they smoke? What's their number one answer? Stress. It's a stress reducer. Oh, wait a minute. How does it reduce stress if it induces physiological stress? If it actually increases heart rate, blood pressure, constricts blood vessels, improves your ability to focus and stimulates brain function, how is that relaxing? Because it also releases dopamine. And everybody knows dopamine as our happy drug. But most people don't realize the levels of which it's released. So real quick going through the levels. When you, we have a conversation, which requires what? A little bit of skill and a little bit of effort. So dopamine release naturally requires always skill and effort. So a conversation, just talking with somebody, finding something in common, finding mutual ground, an interesting topic to engage in, in, in conversation about, that's about a 5% increase in dopamine. Jokes, humor, 5% increase in, in dopamine. Dopamine is a very short-acting drug that is released in very minuscule amounts in the limbic system, particularly the nucleus accumbens, a region of the brain that's kind of like our reward circuitry. And it makes you work for it. So when you engage in a conversation with somebody and you get a 5% increase, it puts a smile on your face. And you're like, oh, wow, hey, that's great. And then it's gone a few seconds later. And you're like, yo, brain, hook me up with some more. And the brain's like, no, nothing's for free. You got to do that again. You got to work for it. Do that again. Just don't do it again. Do it better. So now you re-engage in that conversation and you find something else that is interesting with that person. Now you're getting 5%. They're getting 5%. You're both getting naturally high off of dopamine. You're both improving your moods through conversation from 5% increase. Very short acting, very quickly. It's there. It's gone. Need more. Re-engage. It builds relationships, bonds, trust, friendships, love. Next up is theater, art, culture, playing a musical instrument. About a 15% increase in dopamine. Three times that of a conversation. So when you play the guitar or the drums or you know the violin or whatever it is, and you just get it right after you've been trying to get it right for a month, you get an amazing feeling of satisfaction, happiness, and well-being, which is 15% increase of dopamine from baseline. And then it's gone. And you're like, yo, brain, hook me up some more. And the brain's like, no, you got to do that again. Get back to practicing. Learn a new song. So it motivates that individual. Sports, physical activity, 25% increase in dopamine. And that's about as good as it gets in the human brain. We live in about a 5 to 25% increase of short-acting dopamine for pleasurable uh, opportunities and rewards. And those things motivate us. Now, the nice thing about that natural high cycle of dopamine is you will never, ever regret it. You will always remember it. It'll be stored in our emotional memory, which is technically called the hippocampus. And it will be something that you're proud of usually. You'll be able to reminisce about it in 20 years and not be ashamed of it. You'll get 
pro-social recognition from your peers, from your colleagues, due to it. Now, when we look at natural levels, 25% is about as good as it gets. There's also procreation or intimacy, um, which is about a 50% increase when you actually engage in the intimate act of procreation. Um, but you know, that's not readily accessible from day to day, uh, at any time throughout the day for most people. So we generally live in that five to 25%. Why is intimacy rewarded as the highest level? Mainly because it allows the human species to live on, because it does require skill and effort. First, you have to meet somebody who's willing to talk to you, and then you have to engage in that conversation, and then you have to find mutual interests and, and engage in activities and things and the build up. So, we live in that zero to 50, but mostly zero to 25. Nicotine is somewhere between 15 and 20. Some studies show as high as 100. I like to look at averages from various research documents and, and uh, you know, peer review journals. And the number that I've been able to come up with most frequently is around somewhere around 15 to 20 percent increase in dopamine, somewhere around in between art and theater and music and physical activity. Now the kicker is, is that it's not short acting, it's long acting, and it'll last 15 to 20 minutes. And during that 15 to 20 minutes, that person has an improved mood. And so remember that cubicle worker I mentioned? Now that cubicle worker is happy in the cubicle with no windows, they're focused, and they're being uber productive, and employers used to love smokers. And the non-smoker was in the cubicle next to him, grumpy, going, oh, I hate this cubicle. Oh, I, can't, I can't wait till lunch. And they were productive, don't get me wrong. But for whatever reason, they were looking over at the smoker like, why is that guy's gal so happy? Once Clean Indoor Air Act and our health initiatives to protect you know, co-workers and individuals themselves kicked in, now all of a sudden that smoker had to go down four or five flights of stairs go outside for five to 10 minutes at a time, utilize their stimulant drug and their dopamine producing drug. They'd feel good for about 15 or 20 minutes when they come back inside. But for the 45 minutes remaining in that hour, they were actually experiencing withdrawal where they were finding it difficult to focus. They were grouchy, they were unhappy, and all of a sudden their productivity crashed way below that of a non-smoker. And so what we're seeing right now in high schools and junior highs across the country are young people discovering that, wow, nicotine makes improves my mood and it actually allows me to focus for a short duration of time. That, that's a win-win and it doesn't have tar or carcinogens or smoke in it. So there's this complete disregard for basic health. And I see young people who are, for the utmost part, relatively healthy. They're sports-minded, they may be engaged in, in activities and sports and clubs, and yet they're vaping nicotine, which doubles the likelihood that they will experience a stroke or coronary heart disease. Because when smokers die due to smoking, everybody thinks it's due to cancer. The majority of smokers die due to coronary heart disease, which is caused by the nicotine. And when that individual is on the coroner's table and is being examined, examined, the coroner is like, oh, well, here, here's a tumor, there's a tumor, here's a tumor. Huh. There's cancer all over the place. Coronary heart disease got him first. So if you're one of the pe people who avoids a coronary heart disease and a smoker, you end up with cancer. So we have an entire generation of young people who think vaping is harmless who are going to end up with coronary heart disease but they're just gonna vape for a year or two and then quit. No, because nicotine is the addictive substance. All right. Nicotine isn't classified as a carcinogen, but what it is classified as is a tumor enhancer. So young people who are like, there's no carcinogens in this. What you're actually vaping and inhaling is a tumor enhancer drug. So young people, Adults, there's misinformation occurring during mitosis and cellular reproduction. And what happens when a cell recognizes an error, what is it? The lysomes are sent out and it tries to fix the error. If it can't do it, the cell goes into what's called apoptosis or programmed cellular death. It 
self-destructs to prevent that cell from recreating an error. Nicotine takes away the cell's ability to self-destruct. So that error or that cancer I have a six-year-old son at home, soon to be seven. One of the reasons I do what I do is because I sincerely care about young people. If you're over 21, go ahead and do whatever you want. My office is open 20, <laughs> five days a week. All right, you can get a hold of me in the, uh, at, the, at my phone number if you want to quit smoking. I do this to help young people avoid long-term health issues because they're being misinformed. They're being taken advantage of. So effects of nicotine on the body. I already talked about how it increases blood pressure, heart rate, strips away the protective Teflon-like coating of the arterial walls, constricts arteries and blood vessels, releases stored fats. Um, this is just uh, a graph here of showing where we were in the 1970s. We were around 40%. In the 80s, we were somewhere in the high 30s, pushing 40% of adults who smoked. This is, uh, this is when I was in high school here. Somewhere in the early 90s, we started tracking seniors and high school age youth and who smoked. And we saw a huge spike. Anybody want to guess what that was? Camel Joe, direct to consumer marketing. We had cartoon like thing, you know, characters being marketed towards young people. Jewels are marketed towards young people. They can put it any way they want. They can market it and say, you know, we're here for the smokers, to, for a safer alternative to smoking. No, you're there to make money and you're predatorily marketing it to, to, to young people. The name itself, Jewel. What's a Jewel? A Jewel is something that's cherished. It's sought after. It's beautiful. It's something that everybody wants, right? We want a Jewel on our rings, on our necklaces, on our watches. So marketing is one reason why we see an increase. Anytime the marketing gets out of hand, we come back and we raise education and dispel misinformation and things usually get better. So that's where we are now. We're on the downslope, hopefully. Right now, we're below 17% of high school seniors have smoked uh, in their lifetime, or, or excuse me, 30 days, in the last 30 days. So when we look at data, this is Bucks County, this is a Pennsylvania Youth Survey. So some people may be familiar with the Pennsylvania Youth Survey. It's a survey that's provided every two years in schools, and it asks young people questions like, you know, do you feel safe in your school? Uh, are there, uh, you know, uh, do you see anything from guns to drugs to this or that? And there's also questions about how much substances and what substances the individual uses. And when we look at cigarettes, here in Bucks County, it's provided every two years. So this dark blue is 2013, this light blue is 2015, and this darker navy blue is 2017. This is lifetime use of tobacco products for high school seniors. As you can see, we've been, do we've been doing a stellar job decreasing seniors using tobacco products. Smokeless tobacco, again, consistent reduction in report of, their, of uh, lifetime use with uh, the these tobacco products. Smokeless tobacco has historically been reserved for sports-minded individuals who don't want to impact their lung function, all right? Um, however, the mucosal absorption of these very carcinogenic uh, substances can lead to tumors of the throat, neck, head, brain. Um, cigarettes, 30-day use, even lower, right? So right now in Bucks County, we're somewhere right around 16% of high school seniors in 2013 reported using. And in Bucks County, we've gone below the 10% marker of high school seniors reporting cigarette use uh, in the last 30 days, which is fantastic. However, when we jump over here and we look at vaping e-cigarettes, 2015 was the first year we asked this question. In 2015, we had of approximately 28% of high school seniors reported using in the last 30 days. In 2017, we were at 38%, a 10% increase in two years. So we've seen a reduction in tobacco use, but we've seen a significant increase. Now look at 30-day use. 30-day use is higher than lifetime use. This is 30-day use of tobacco product. 
This is 30 day use of e-cigarettes. What are they using? In 2015, seniors reported that approximately 38% of them, or excuse me, 58% um, of them reported just electronic non-nicotine juice. In 2017, fewer people reported using non-nicotine juice. Nicotine in use reversely increased. So in 2015, we only had about 38% reporting nicotine use. And in 2017, we were pushing 38%, or excuse me, 48%. Um, so we've seen an increase in nicotine use. Marijuana or hash oil also increased. Yes, you can use hash oil products in these devices, whether it's a Juul, whether it's a MAC-10, whether it's a Soren, whether it's a, uh, whether it's a specific vape device just for hash oil products. You can use them in any one. And so schools are now testing, field testing with the safety officers to see if there's cannabis. And just because cannabis is medicinally legal here in PA for adults does not mean that it's legal to have in your jewel when you're an underage minor. That is still a misdemeanor and possibly a felony. If you share that device on school grounds and it's distributing a controlled substance, that becomes a felony. Um, this one is disturbing. Sixth graders. Yes, sixth graders are vaping. All right. And reports of younger. I don't know. Over 80% of sixth graders, if they vape, they don't know what's in it because they're handed to it by older peers or siblings or whoever. They're very trusting. All right. So traditional tobacco. It's not going anywhere. Traditional tobacco is still very popular. Um, Almost 17% of high school seniors have smoked it. In Bucks County, we're now less than 10%, all right? But nonetheless, in PA and in, across the country, um, we now look at tobacco products as not a habit anymore. It's a social experience. Gone are the days when smoking is mostly a habit. Today, many smokers consider their smoking experience as a time to meet and catch up with friends. There are even online groups that will meet just to share their favorite cigar. And if you're smoking cigars, usually it's going to be a Cigarello or a Black and Mild, which they make very specific tools in order to uh, modify that Black and Mild. Because a cigar is designed to throat hit only. Mucosal absorption through the throat. It was never designed to be taken into the lungs. So it's packed very tightly. And so if you were to try to smoke a cigar like a traditional cigarette, you'd be like, and the blood vessel would be popping out of your head because it's packed very tightly. So what young people do, and adults alike, this is not an adolescent thing. This is 20 and 30-year-old people who are partaking in this. They, what's called freak or um, a black and mild, also uh, called uh, champ a black. So what they do is basically they take one of these and they come in cellophane and roll it back and forth. Um, and the tobacco is loosened. It falls out. And now you remove the very dangerous chemical laced paper that's in there because that's the bad part. Or at least that's what the young people and young adults and adults alike look at. They neglect the fact that tobacco has nicotine, carcinogens, tar, all these other things. They're more concerned about the paper that has, it does, have some chemicals in it that slows the burn. But if you're concerned about your health, let's take a look at the actual tobacco that you're consuming in this, inhaling. So once you remove the paper, you reinsert the tobacco into the, the black and mild wrap. And now you just kind of tap it a little like, that to kind of pack it down just slightly and now it smokes like a cigarette each one of these um cigarellos or black and milds are equivalent to about 10 cigarettes the tar and nicotine in 10 cigarettes is in one black and mild so here's a youtube assignment for you youtube how to how to uh how to freak a black and mild and you will see hundreds of videos come up of 16, 17-year-old young people sitting in their car in a park showing you, filming themselves on their phone, how to champ or freak a black and mild.
All right. And then they're smoking it and they're smoking it like a cigarette. 10 cigarettes in one sitting. All right. So we see more and more research that something that was originally designed as a cessation aid, something that was originally designed to help people quit smoking 10 years ago, is now actually being marketed and utilized as the healthy alternative to smoking. It's not an alternative. Can it be utilized as a cessation aid? Theoretically, yes. Um, people have come to me and they say, I don't want to use a patch. I don't want to use the gum. I don't want to use the lozenges. I just want to use this vape device. And I'm like, all right, well, I can't recommend it. I can't suggest it. I don't agree with it. But if you agree to use it as a step down titration, in other words, you reduce the milligrams in that nicotine juice to zero over a period of two to three months, then I'll work with you. But if you're just looking for a replacement, you don't need me. It's not a healthy alternative. It's an unhealthy alternative. Is it less harmful than smoking? Yes. But is it still harmful? Extremely. All right. So what we're seeing are young people starting on vaping. They build a tolerance. They build a dependency. They become grouchy, irritable when they're not vaping. And slowly they start to recognize the dopamine is, is released, the stimulant effect is in action when they vape, and they become dependent on it to function at baseline. Now costs raise because tolerance builds, and these things initially are less expensive. If you're using it as a cessation aid, it's less expensive than smoking. Because each pod is equivalent to about, like if you're using jewels, one pod is equivalent to a pack of cigarettes. You get four pods for around $20. A pack of cigarettes, anywhere from seven to $11, depending on where you're you know, uh, logistically located in PA. So it is less expensive than smoking. But what people discover is that once they discover that it's discreet, you can usually do it anywhere, and you don't even have to exhale it. You can just hit it. <laughs> Small, small, and you don't even need to exhale it. You do what's called a zero. You just swallow it. And so now you can do this all day long, and you're never in withdrawal. You're just hitting nicotine for during your waking hours. So your heart rate, your blood pressure is elevated pretty much all day long and you are doing irreversible damage to your coronary system. And you may be healthy and young now, and you may not see the effects of it, but come your 20s and 30s, you will see the effect of it. As an ex-smoker, I smoked in the 80s. I already told you our high school had a smoking section. Why did I smoke? Because I wanted to be cool. Because I thought it was cool. My dad smoked. Over 40, almost 40% 40 of the population smoked. I wanted to be my dad. I wanted to be the, the older kids at school. I wanted to be the fashionable people I saw on TV. The Marlboro man was wicked cool. I mean, here's this guy with like leathery skin. I mean, he's like bending barbed wire with his bare hands, right? So began smoking. Smoked throughout the Air Force. Once I got out of the service, Entered college, during college, diagnosed with cancer. That's not fun. Radiation treatment isn't fun. Invasive surgery isn't fun. So that's one of the reasons why I do what I do. Because I want you, all the young people who may be watching this on YouTube or whatnot, if you got this far into the video, <laughs> to, to really consider, is it worth it? And what you'll discover in your 20s is you actually never were cool. It's not what you do that makes you cool. It's how you do it, and if it's something that you're going to be proud of, and if it requires skill and effort, that's cool. Vaping, no skill, no effort. Anybody can do it. Smoking, no skill, no effort. Anybody can do it. No skill whatsoever. I've never met anybody who's proud of smoking or vaping. Menthol cigarettes, when somebody builds that tolerance on vaping, of jewel pods, they don't just continue to spend more and more on nicotine juice 
because the nicotine juice is actually less effective at delivering nicotine into the bloodstream than a cigarette. When electronic nicotine delivery systems or vape devices were originally put on the market, it was just straight nicotine juice. And it was very obvious that this was an ineffective way to deliver nicotine into the bloodstream. So they started freebasing it into something called nicotine salts. So now most of the best sellers are nicotine salt based or free based versions of natural nicotine in order to get it into the bloodstream. But still, there's no better way to deliver nicotine into the bloodstream than with a traditional heating of a tobacco plant material and inhaling. And so when a person, the costs and the maintenance and the inconvenience rises, they move to a pack of cigarettes. Because now a pack of cigarettes at $7 a day is less than the $15 or $10 that they're spending on the jewel pods. I've worked with eighth graders who are vaping two jewel pods a day. That's $10 a day in eighth grade. And why are they doing it? Because they can do it anywhere. And as much as schools are trying to combat this, they're really powerless. This is more an issue for parents than the school. And I hate to get cynical, but schools are here to educate and teach. It's really difficult when you take away from those opportunities to educate and teach, and now you have to police the bathrooms and the classrooms and take away from class time. So the kids are going to get away with it because it's just impossible to really catch. We just don't have the resources for it. And the schools are doing all they can to combat this. So when a person moves to tobacco, they usually move to menthol because menthol has a very interesting effect on how nicotine interacts with the body and the way of how smoke or tobacco products are delivered to the lungs. So when we have children and they're sick and they're in their room coughing at night, what do we slide into their room? A humidifier. And what do we put in that humidifier? We put a little Vicks menthol pad, right? And that allows that child to breathe in the menthol, which expands their lung capacity, which allows them to breathe easier and take deeper breaths and get the oxygen that's vital to life and sleep better and not cough. That is exactly what menthol cigarettes do. I've worked with individuals who have been smoking two packs a day for 10 years, and they're like, I can't breathe unless I'm smoking my, my, my menthols. And it's exactly the reason why. They need the menthol cigarette in order to actually breathe regularly. When they're not smoking, they can't get good breaths. Now, menthol also acts at the metabolic center or core of your body. And the, what it does is it slows down the metabolization of nicotine in the human body. So now a high, a stimulant effect that usually typically lasts 10 to 15 minutes is now lasting anywhere from 20 to 25 minutes because menthol slows down the metabolization of nicotine in the human body. So it's a more addictive, more effective delivery system than any other cigarette on the face of the planet. And that, when people move from vaping to cigarettes, that's the one they're going with. And what age does that usually occur? College bound. Out of the nest, away from the parents' discretion, away from peering eyes, money's tight. I can now buy a pack of menthols for $7 and have $3 left over to buy some ramen so I can eat. Compared to the jewels that you're vaping $10 worth a day of. So it's a money issue too. So back to vaping. Again, electronic nicotine delivery system. Um, five truths. Ends are less harmful, absolutely. Our ends are harmful though. <laughs> less harmful, harmful. Still extremely harmful. It is nicotine. It does irreversible damage. It hardens arteries and blood vessels. Every time you smoke or vape, or inhale, you are doing damage. I don't care how you write it. Even FDA approved patches, gum, and lozenges do damage. 
but it's risk benefit. A person has been smoking a pack of cigarettes for 20 years. We move them to a patch for three months, eliminate the smoke, the tar, the carcinogens, and now they're off of it altogether within three to four months. Risk benefit. Benefit outweighs the risk. Ends are not the best smoking cessation aid. Um, they're equally addicted to cigarettes, and they're getting a newer generation hooked on nicotine. Altria just bought 33% of Juul. Altria, big tobacco. They just are, they are now the shareholder of Juul. You would think a cessation aid would be fought tooth and nail by big tobacco, but they know what's going on. They're genius. They are the best marketers in the history of the world, big tobacco. They have the best marketing team ever, hands down. They know that, huh, let's buy into this. Let's make money on it. And what we're doing is in 10 years, we have a whole new generation of smokers. So all of those pays data that shows reduction in smoking, reduction in smoking, reduction in smoking. In about five years, we're going to see increase in smoking, increase in smoking, increase in smoking in adult age adults. And we're also going to see an increase in health insurance costs, and we're going to see a strain on the system, and we're going to see increased rates of cardiovascular system disorders, diseases, and cancers of the lungs and body. Because nicotine just doesn't stay in the lungs. It travels. It's transient. It gets around. And it's a tumor enhancer wherever it lands. Youth marketing. You know, it's, it, it's problematic. This gentleman here, who is he? Uh, I, I'm not big on watching TV. Uh, Scott Dysick. He's, I guess he's a Kardashian member somehow. Here's a man who's, uh, from the looks of it, in his 40s, just found this new vape brand, and they are unbelievable. They are completely compatible with Juul. My favorite flavor is mango. Click here to check them out. All right. Yeah, I'm, I'm from Jersey. I would love to have a one-on-one -on -one with this guy, a little side conversation. He's 40 years old, promoting tobacco use to minors. In my opinion, this is what's wrong. This is why we see so many youth smoking and vaping, is because it's glorified just like it was 20, 30, 40 years ago. You'd think we would have learned, but we're not. TV, commercials. This is what it was originally designed as, a cessation aid. It looked like a cigarette, had an LED on the end, had steam, aspiration. This was taken out of a men's health magazine. Steam, aspiration doesn't sell to young people. This didn't sell because people who wanted to quit wanted to use FDA-approved methods. This still had stigma attached to it. When they left, uh, when they go outside to vape, people still looked at them like they were smoking a cigarette because... It glowed, it looked like a cigarette, and you were blowing out what looked like smoke. But it's aerosol. And so this didn't really sell. These are the ones that caught on because they don't look like a cigarette. And they're customizable, and you can put flavors in it, and you can modify it. You can heat the coil up to burn it more efficiently for a bigger throat hit or turn it down for a less of a throat hit. You can modify them, and they don't look like a smoker. You look cool. It's not vapor, it's aerosol, as I mentioned. The aerosol is made up of submicron particles of condensed vapor, which mostly consist of propylene, glycol, glycerol, water flavorings, nicotine, and other chemicals. The other chemicals, we don't know. We do know that some of the fl flavorings that are being marketed, especially at the proprietary uh, vape stores, you know, they have in there, we use FDA-approved flavorings. That's great. Good for you. I'm, I'm happy for you. You use FDA-approved flavorings. The only problem with that sign is that it's FDA approved for food, ingestion, digestion, and evacuation. That's what it's approved for. First and second pass metabolization. It was never approved by the FDA for heating and inhalation because when you heat and inhale some of these flavoring agents, they become toxic to lung tissue. One particular is diacetyl. It scars lung tissue on contact. And it's in a majority of the sweet flavors, such as razzmatazz, birthday cake, watermelon, raspberry, bubblegum. These are the flavors that young people are marketed to. Very many different versions and shapes. They all carry the same risks. 
Um, I mean, you know, I do, I, I give you a challenge. You get online and spend a half an hour of type in Google, why should I vape or should I vape? And what you'll find are forum after forum after forum and advertiser after advertiser pitching the, the uh, safe alternative to smoking. Other ones are Soren Air, um, the UL Caliburn pod system. So each one of these pods contains about equivalent to a pack of cigarettes. And they're disposable. You just keep buying them. You can hack them. You can refill them. But after about the second or third refill, they, they become um, unfunctional. Because the coils in them, this isn't truly vaping. It's conductive burning of an oil. Because the oil comes into contact with a burning hot element and it burns the oil. And what happens with this coil is it's made of tin, lead, manganese, various cheap materials that are mass produced and imported. And when the oil or the liquid comes, the alcohol-based solution comes into contact with that coil, that superheated, expanded coil all of a sudden super shrinks rapidly and it sloughs off microscopic particles of lead, tin, lead, manganese and they adhere deep into the lung tissue, and they build up and accumulate. Jewels are the number one vape trend, without a doubt. Great marketing. Um, they have reeled it back, and now they have done away with their social media, their campaigns for younger looking people, and now they have people who look like me sitting on a plaid couch in, the home of, in their house, sitting on a couch with their jewel device going, I've been a smoker for 20 years, and I finally found something that allowed me to quit smoking. You know, it's like, I'm not cool, and I'm not going to sell their product, and I'm sitting on a plaid couch. So they've changed their product because various powers that be have come after them and said, you're predatorily marketing. We're going to come after you if you don't change your way. So now they're really pushing the cessation methods, but it's still, the, the, the damage is already done. It is popular. And these are very easy to hack. This is the coil. This is the mouthpiece. The, the liquid is suspended in the plastic here. This little black top, you can just pull this off. You dump out some of the e-juice and you dump in some hash oil. And now you can vape hash oil and nicotine at the same time. And nobody knows because the aroma of marijuana is missing when you vape it. All you'll smell is the mango or the mint brulee or whatever flavor that you're masking it with. All right. Um, so back to the dopamine, the problem of cross utilization to these things. Remember, nicotine is about 15 to 20 percent, somewhere between art and music and sports or physical activity. Cannabis is a hundred percent increase in dopamine, four times out of sports. 20 times out of a conversation. What the brain learns very easily and very quickly is why should I bother with things that require skill and effort and result in a small reward when I can just do this that requires no skill, no effort, and a large reward? And it starts pretty benignly. It starts occasional use, more frequent, weekends, maybe Wednesdays, and over the period of six months, a year, to a year and a half, a young person who was a non-smoker, non-vapor, now becomes a vapor, nicotine user, and then they're introduced to hash oil, and they discover the 100% increase in dopamine, and they like it. Why do people use drugs? Because they like it. There's a saying, everything is better on pot. They say that because it's a 100% increase in dopamine. And it's not short acting. It lasts 45 minutes to two hours. And so what these young people end up year, two, three down the road is reducing the interaction and things that they were once passionate about, which resulted in pride, integrity, positive social recognition from their peers and adults in their life to somebody who isolates, no longer engages in these things and no longer pushes their ability and builds their skill set. And they put forth less and less effort. So is nicotine, per se, a gateway or an introductory drug to cannabis? Absolutely. Absolutely. Especially when you can cross-utilize the devices. Um, right now with cannabis, in the 70s, we had a very low perceived level of harm about, uh, with cannabis, and we had a very high use. In the 80s, 
we started campaigning and saying it's a drug, it's dangerous. So we had a high perceived level of harm about it and use shot down. Right now, we have a very low perceived level of risk and we have a very high use. Is it medicinal? I'm not going to argue that. Every medicine comes from a plant. If you have one of the 21 diagnosable illnesses on the Pennsylvania Department of Health's website and you're an adult and you want to use this medicinally, I have no opinion on that. But if you're a young person looking to get high to escape and self-medicate and cope and celebratory, I get it. You're supposed to be experimental, but you're supposed to be experimental with pro-social healthy things that result in integrity and pride and allow you to discover what you're capable of, where your skill sets lie, what you'll be proud of in 10 or 15 years when you're telling your six-year-old about what you used to do. Um, you know, academic and vocational outcomes, it costs the schools with lower grades, higher dropout rates. Um, it costs the schools a fortune, and that cost is fed down to the taxpayer to enforce, to regulate, um, dropping scores, less money that the schools receive. Colleges, increased chances to skip classes, lower GPA because they can't focus. Remember that person, that cubicle worker coming in? and not being able to focus because they're in protracted withdrawal from their nicotine cravings. That's what students experience when they can't vape or smoke in class. Decreased lifetime earning potential. I like making money. How many people here like making money? Money allows us a standard of living. I don't want to jeopardize that by doing things that are going to cost me money. And young people don't grasp this. It will cost you. You will earn less. This isn't 1960 and 70 anymore. Smoking is not accepted. Cannabis, particularly bad for young people, impaired judgment, prefrontal cortex, uh, malleability or plasticity of the brain, the critical period between ages of 12 and 21, roughly 25, and for males well into our 30s, just joking. But seriously, we, our brains don't fully develop until our mid-20s. And I like to use an analogy. If I gave a room full of people a lump of clay and I gave you a week to make a mug and I told you, you're not getting graded on it. I just want you to make a mug, a drinking device and bring it back in a week. And it, some people would do it. Some people might take 10, 15 minutes and make a mug and bring it back. And then when it's brought back, what do we do? We put it in a kiln, we fire it, we give it back to that person. Where does that mug end up? in the trash somewhere because A, it's not important, it wasn't graded, and there was no explanation of why we shouldn't take time to make this mug. But after you fire it, you can't change it. It's a done deal. And so that's why it ends up in the trash because it can't be utilized effectively. It's not important. Now let's flip that. Let's say I'm a genie and I give each and everyone in a room a lump of clay and I say, you have a week to make a mug, but this is the only drinking device that you're ever going to have for the rest of your life. And if you lose it, break it, misplace it, give it away, you can never make another one. You can't buy another one. You can't be gifted another one. This is the only drinking device that you'll ever have for the rest of your life. If you do something with it to where you no longer have it, you have to drink out of your hands. And you only have a week to make it. Now, all of a sudden, the person who spent 10 minutes is spending hours upon hours making it as perfect as possible because they want to put that mug on the shelf in their house in future years and be like, yeah, I made that. They want to be proud of it. They want it to fit their hand. They want it to drink both hot and cold liquids equally. It's important, and it's the only one you're ever going to get, and that is the human brain, and you have roughly between 12 and 21 to mold this thing as perfectly as possible, and if you don't, you're going to have impaired judgment as an adult. You're going to have psychotic breaks it, with chronic substance use, brain morphology changes, all right? All of these habits. When I was working with people who were experiencing substance use disorders, they every last one of them picked them up in their teen years. So, you know, heroin amongst marijuana users, is there a correlation? Yes. If you smoke weed, are you going to end up shooting dope? Not necessarily. It's just a suggestion that if you surround yourself with antisocial, unhealthy activities, there's going to be other unhealthy 
antisocial activities that come into that peer group. And you don't know if you're going to say no. Nancy Reagan, I really liked her. She was a nice lady. She came up with the slogan, just say no. Really nice lady, bad implementation of that message. Just say no means absolutely nothing to young people. What you have to give young people is a reason to say no. All right, and that's through education. Medical marijuana, it's not approved by the FDA, nor prescribed dispense like medicine. You have one of the 21 you know, uh, classification or diagnosis. The doctor says he has one of these. Cannabis is appropriate. The person takes that script to a dispensary, and that dispensary then determines with non-medical people how much you should smoke, for what reason. So there's no other medicine that's distributed like this. So we've got a ways to go, all right? Um, my concern with it is diversion because there's no limit on how much a person can buy. And they can buy way more than they could ever use. And so it's being diverted for money. And it's ending up in the hands of young people. So vaping cannabis, my big concern, uh, when we look at seized cannabis products, particularly hash oil products, uh, the Philadelphia Can High Intensity Drug Trafficking Task Force Agency is an organization down near Philadelphia that oversees the testing of all products of all illicit drugs that are seized. 87% of hash oil products seized in Southeast PA are what's called a butane hash oil product. That You may heard butane hash oil, and you may not recognize the severe impact that this has on a, on a brain, whether developing or fully developed. Butane is a neurotoxin. Chronic exposure can lead to brain lesions. And these products, the majority of them, are butane hash oil extraction. So why? Because this process for somebody who's growing in their you know, illicit labs or grow rooms, um, they are looking for the cheapest way to extract the hash oil from the plants. You can buy a setup to extract hash oil for around 50 or $75 with, hash, with butane, whereas with um, carbon dioxide hash oil extraction, which is the version they use in medicinal dispensaries, that's about $20,000 for the setup. So overhead, butane. And the way they do it is they take all the clippings from the buds and the plant and the stalks and the stems and the leaves, the waste product of the plant, pack it into a PVC pipe, put a coffee filter on the end, pump about five or six large bottles of butane over that product. The butane strips the tetrahydrocannabinol off of that plant, lands in a cookie sheet, and then the butane evaporates and you're left with a wax, a shatter, a crumble, an oil, depending on the ratio of the butane and the cannabis. And now, when a young person vapes it, they're exposing their brain to all of the toxins that were in that butane are now in the hash oil. And chronic exposure to butane chemicals lead to brain lesions. So health concern. It's not just about getting high. It's about what young people are doing to their brain. Here in Bucks County, if a young person is vaping hash oil, they have an 87% likelihood it's a butane product. These are just some of the forms. Dabs, wax, shatter, crumble, and all can be vaped. All you have to do is buy a melter. It's a little like eyedropper. Um, you can melt this wax or shatter or crumble into a liquid, and then you can load it into your, your jewel pod or your vape device, and you won't smell it. If you don't want to go that route, you can buy a Pax, which is the parent company of Juul. These people are the ones who invented Juul and then sold it off. They originally came into a business for selling for the cannabis market. So each one of these pods, this is an oil pod, a wax pod, a dry herb pod, and a concentrate pod, depending on the number of coils and temperature of the coils for the products. However, you can still vape oil in any product. It's just not going to be as efficient in a jewel as a PAX. This is a video that I'm not going to show because I want to be respectful of your time. But I, if you're at home and you're on watching this on YouTube, just type in how to hack a jewel. And it comes up with like a man in his, I don't know, 30s with like a beard showing young people how to put hash oil in a jewel pod. All right. Um, so that is 
vaping, electronic nicotine delivery systems, um, tobacco. I hope you learned something. I hope you're walking away with a little bit more information than you walked in here with. Um, I'm sorry. Hello? Uh, yeah. This is all very important information as parents, as teachers, as community members, uh, because really we just want to preserve the health of our communities and our, and our future generations. So questions. And there's no bad questions, only really bad answers. And I like to think I don't give those. Thank you. Yes, edibles. What type of edibles are you um, discussing with youth of today? And what are in the edibles that you're um, hearing about? How about now? Is this OK? I think the battery's going on it. Um, so edibles, the problem with edibles is titration. All right. Um, titration is dose response for desired effect. Um, so if somebody is using an edible, um, it's usually, you know, cooked with a butter, a, a, a THC butter or another hash oil type um, product. And the directions read for a brownie, it'll say, you know, take a square or a corner, eat, wait 25 to 35 minutes for a response and redose as needed. The problem with edible cannabis is that people usually aren't patient. So they take that small bite, they wait 20, 25 minutes, they feel no response, so they take another bite. And they might not feel it right away, so they take another bite. What, everybody's different. Everybody's metabolic rate is different. You have to wait for it to metabolize, to release the THC into the bloodstream, to get the effect. Now, the problem with edibles is it's not like it's just gone in 45 minutes or an hour. You're along for a very long ride, which can range anywhere from four to six hours. And if it's an unpleasant experience, it can put that young person or adult into situations that might get them into some sticky situations, such as legal situations, uh, employment, uh, loss of employment because they were supposed to go to work, but they can't because they thought the high was just going to last an hour or two, but now it's six hours later and they're still experiencing it. So edibles are, um, you know, a, a high potential for getting into situations that you weren't planning. All right. Um, are, is it less toxic or more toxic than smoking? Um, it, you know, I, I hate to say it, it's probably less toxic. Uh, because you're not exposing the lungs to the to the smoke or the vape and the and the byproducts, but it's still a drug and it's still releasing 100% dopamine. And why do young people have a low perceived level of harm about cannabis products? Because it is 100%. Because when they Google which is the least harmful drug known to man, marijuana comes up. Because cocaine is a 300% increase in dopamine. Methamphetamine is a 600% increase. Uh, excuse me, crack cocaine is a 600% increase. Methamphetamine is a, thousand, is, a, is a factor of 10, a thousand percent increase. And opiates are 1400% increase in dopamine. And they're all long acting. So when young people see that, they're like, oh, well, weed is like the least harmful. It's only 100%. But what they don't get is the information of where they live from day to day, which is that 5 to 25%. So when you compare 100 to that 5 to 25, all of a sudden it looks pretty pretty serious. So I hope I answered your question. Another question. Yeah. I, I think a mic's coming to you because I, I know that they're streaming this. So I, the people watching won't hear the question. They'll just hear the answer. Yes. Um, my question was related to the slide that you show uh, the use of um, heroin. Exactly that. Could you elaborate a little bit more how uh, cannabis actually is kind of a precursor? Of, yeah. Uh, so what you're actually doing, really good question, by the way. So what you're doing, uh, are we good on time? We're, we're good on time? We'll go over. All right. um, what we're actually doing is we're laying down neural pathways. 
of low skill, low effort, high reward. And we're training that brain during the developmental period to look for things that require low skill, low effort, and have a high reward. And when a young person builds tolerance, the, the, the likelihood that they'll try other substances increase. And so right now, we're kind of living in a perfect storm. Access, purity, and perceived level of harm. The cannabis that would have been available to me in the 80s in high school was on average 3.5% by, by volume. 3.5% THC. It had stems, it had seeds, five people smoked it, you laugh for 15, 20 minutes, and then you end up with a wicked headache because it was sprayed with Raid, and it was just terrible. The cannabis, and you had to drive in to cities to get it. There were no drug dealers in high schools. Well, there were, but not like now. Drug dealers are a thing of the past. If you smoke, if you puff, if you burn, you're going to hook up your friends. And access is ridiculous. 15, 20 minutes. Meet you at the 7-Eleven at lunch, you know, um, whatnot. And so the cannabis now, average purity for flowering material, bud, smokable form, 16 to 30% THC. Hash oil products, 60 to 80% THC, and edibles in excess of 90%. So it's not the pot that our generation may have smoked and turned out okay. This entire new generation is a science experiment of how priming the brain for dependency, no matter what the substance, increases the likelihood of using other substances. And when you look at the access to other substances, such as Percocet, Percoten, Codeine, um, Cocaine, Molly, MDMA, these things are all just as easily accessible. And what that developing adolescent brain lacks is the prefrontal cortex, the ability to make sound decisions in instance. Previous generations had to put forth effort and plan days in advance to, to get alcohol or a pot. And fortunately, many people thought about it. I was like, ah, maybe I'm not going to do this. But when you can get something within 10 to 15 minutes, you don't have time to process that thought. So that's why this correlation is so extreme. Is access, purity, and perceived level of harm of all substances. It's not necessarily if you smoke pot, you're going to do heroin. It's just that it's priming that addictive behavior, the drug-seeking behavior, and access to various different substances. Did I answer your question? Awesome. All right. Maybe time for one more question. All right. Um, I'll stick around for a few minutes afterwards if you want to come up and ask any questions that you weren't comfortable asking uh, on a public forum. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Council Rock School District. You guys are great. Um, I appreciate the invite. I hope you all have a great night.